Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Epic Vision Zone. My name is Jane Applegath, founder of the Epic Vision Zone, conversations that inspire. Each show, we offer you an inspiring person or message to bring you closer to your big vision so that you can live your epic life now. Thank you for being here. And if you're listening to the audio version, be sure to follow the episode on your favorite app, and if you're watching the YouTube channel, be sure to go ahead and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. The 13th century poet Rumi wrote, you are not a drop in the ocean, but the entire ocean in a single drop. Dr. Ardashir Mirham is a psychologist, a psychoanalyst, transformation expert, and leadership coach who has helped organizations revitalize their culture drive employee and customer engagement, and develop the next generation of leaders. With 30 plus years of research and innovation in emotional health and human behavior, Dr. Mirham is also an emotional peak performance architect and author of the groundbreaking new book titled, You Are Not Depressed, You Are Unfinished, Using Feelings of Depression and Anxiety to Fuel a Soaring Life, which I cannot wait to talk about. With a PhD and MED from Columbia University, Organizational Counseling quantitative psychology and more, the subject of emotional wellness is a reality and priority for Dr. Mirham. In addition to personally experiencing depression and anxiety while in a key leadership role, he has heard firsthand as a coach how it impacts the performance of high achievers. Known as a performance motivator across multiple industries and a gifted researcher, Dr. Mirham uses keen observations and direct influencing skills to help global leaders, star performers, and corporate teams step fully into their roles as leaders while harnessing the opportunities to inspire change. He lives in the Bay Area with his wife and son and his golden retriever, Lucy. His passions include running, hiking, biking, swimming, reading, photography, poetry, and music. Welcome, Dr. Mirham. I am so honored to have you join us here today. Jane, thank you so much to be with you here and uh, an honor and uh, look forward for us to having some heart to heart conversation about health and healing. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So let's get started from the beginning, my question is, yeah. what inspired you to do the work that you do today? Great, thank you. You started with Rumi. So Rumi has multiple statements that, imagine that in the year of 1300, that to this day resonate. Another statement by Rumi says, the answer to pain is through the pain. Mm -hmm. So, I got, when I went to get my doctorate, I have triple majors, I have four masters, double major undergraduate, and I have so many credentials, license that it's actually rather embarrassing. <laughs> it's not that I was trying to get degrees. I was trying to answer a question. Mm -hmm. It was a personal question that why am I hurting so much emotionally? I'm a psychologist. I'm trained to diagnose, to heal, to research emotional behaviors. And in some way, I'm doing this work for my mother, that uh, she lived a life of uh, depression. And you could see it in her face. You could see it in my dad's face as their six siblings. So I came and grew up and thinking depression is part of people's lives. Anxiety is part of people's lives. And when I went to psychology, I was fed the narrative that you go to therapy for years, you know, like, you know, mental health is kind of a fact of life, you know, like you accept it. I didn't believe none of that, that in universe, health and healing, we are designed for healing. And mm -hmm. I felt psychology, it somewhat has fallen in love with illness. In fact, what really blew my mind, I was researching about what does it mean to be emotionally healthy? And go and do any research on that. Nothing really comes up. The only thing that comes up is the work of 
Abraham Maslow needs hierarchy and Viktor Frankl about man's search for meaning. Mm -hmm. But we have a vast body of pathology, depression, anxiety, ADHD, PTSD. And we think health means not being ill. That's incorrect. So I went to this work to um, try to basically heal myself. I've been over the years to seven psychologists, a psychiatrist, medication, only see my depression drops, then comes up again. Mm -hmm. And I came to accept that I will die as a depressed person, just like my mom and my dad. And that it was depressing to me that the universe doesn't decide fates like that. And especially in high performers, people who do well in corporation like me, depression, it's, um, you kind of mask it. You, you have a big smile on your face. So people who knew me, I, while I was getting promoted, becoming a vice president, um, I was a team leader, role model, mentoring people, deep down I was dead. I was flat and people would see my smile and they thought I was doing well, which a lot of executives do, a lot of high performers, entrepreneurs. Deep down, I was not well. And I gave up after a while going to psychotherapists. I felt they don't get me. Mm. It was through my work that they don't get me. I started to, at certain point, which is in my book, on the August, 3rd August, of um, Sunday on 2012, as I woke up at 6.30 in the morning to journal, which I typically do, I ask two different questions that put me in a different trajectory. Instead of asking, how do I heal my depression and anxiety? I ask the question, what is depression? Mm. What is anxiety? And I started to realize the whole clinical description of depression and anxiety is like a tip of the iceberg. They actually, they miss it. Mm -hmm. That put me on a trajectory about depression, if I net net it for you. Depression, if you are depressed, the dear listeners, basically what it means that there are some basic human experiences that they haven't been shaped for you fully, that there are things missing. There are parts of human experience, emotions, some emotional needs, they haven't been fulfilled for you. They may have been violated, discarded. Nobody taught you, nobody taught us. So that's the reason you're depressed. You know it and you can name it. So once you know what is missing for you as part of your growing up, the way you, vitamins, you know what vitamins you need to take to be healthy, Nobody told us, hey, you, man and woman, you need to have this and this and this to be healthy and a fulfilled life. Once you do that, depression not only dissipate, goes away. Nobody has taught us that. And depression is, is healed, can be healed, can be removed from our human experience. That's what my work is. And, you know, this work, the reason I did that, because I, if I didn't, I would have committed suicide. I would have been gone by now. Mm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. It's so insightful. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it, 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 it's very ingrained in the North, uh, you know, the society here of the yeah. continents here in North America. Uh, about the definition of not only um, mental yeah. capabilities, because it's not mental health, but also just our general health. In ge you know, yeah. it, and the ancients, as you and I have talked a little earlier, you know, they knew a lot, but we didn't yeah. speak yeah. their language. And science has given us that capability now to understand yeah. more. And I yeah. completely agree with you that the body heals it. It's, it wants to heal itself, both mentally yeah. and physically. But we need yeah. to give it the space and the opportunity to do so. So the understanding, but thank you so much for that, that insight into not only your 
your interpretation. And that's why I think the, I know that the work you're doing is groundbreaking, but also for sharing your story. Um, and Thank we're so you. glad you're Thank here you. so that you can, um, you. I read in your book that that is your quest is to eliminate depression and anxiety. And so exactly. all the best to you because that we need it a lot. <laughs> you're very welcome. You. So moving to emotional health and human behavior, why yeah. do executives entrepreneurs yeah. and high achievers have higher rates of emotional struggle yeah a simple answer is is the fallacy of resiliency mm. we in the western world we love resiliency we we have books mm. about it and when you go look at the picture of all those books without exception you see a woman or man like a top dog they're smiling you know, they're showing their chest, you know, fist in palm, I crush it, you know, is the image that we project of a strength to the world. Mm -hmm. That's how you get to succession planning um, level that you show that you're invincible, you can handle it, you can go the difference. In fact, we have other words that is lonely at the top, that uh, we create a solo player a solitary individual to become the head of an organization. We groom them like that. We select them like that, people who can endure a lot. Because people smile, people look great, they smell great, they have houses on the, you know, on the hill, they run fancy cars, we think they are doing well. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't. In fact, we know from research that you name it, depression, anxiety, bipolar, obsessive compulsive, ADHD, the um, substance abuse and suicide rate in executives, high achievers, entrepreneurs is two to three times higher than the average population. Mm -hmm. When in the po general population, depression is around 25% in senior executive is between 30 to 50 percent based upon which results you use so people learn to tolerate it senior leaders high potentials they have a propensity to basically focus on the goal on the business on results and they have the statement i will get to it in fact as as i did work with the leaders the main focus is that i want to crush this number i have a sales mm. goal i have a quarterly meeting and they says arish i know it is important i know i'm not feeling well someday i will get to it i will get mm. to it when at the end of the year in next quarter so what they don't realize that there's a chain reaction that starts with them that what we suppress in our head we express in our bodies other part we see in senior executives, women, they have a senior professional, they have a higher proportion of gastrointestinal issues, diarrhea, um, constipation, the poor gut health. With men is cardiovascular, heart disease, blood pressure, sudden heart attack. Yeah. The reason is that when these are all emotions blocked, unexpressed, and basically ignored. When we do that, body keeps the score. Actually, there's a beautiful book, it's called Body Keeps the Score, that our body becomes the keeper of our pain, mm -hmm. of our sorrow, of the emotions not expressed. So at certain point, in fact, people know this um, in the healthcare environment, I used to be in healthcare, that every day, across the United States, in the adult primary care organizations, up to one third of visits, one third, this is a staggering number, are people go there for ailments, they are based upon depression. This is psychosomatic. Back problem, neck problem, gut problem, heart problem, blood pressure, you know, like in terms of sleeping, uh, migraine, we know these are all, and the doctors know this, is depression, but they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. You can't tell the person goes to a psychiatrist, says, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and so what they do, they keep prescribed medications. 
Yeah. And the reason doctors know that those patients have the thickest medical record, they keep coming back for the same ailment. So depression kills, depression destroys our body, but we don't know what to do with it. And so we sit there mm -hmm. and we tolerate it and we hope for the best and we drink it away, we ignore it. But that's, to me, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yes, I could, um, absolutely. Uh, I love that analogy that the body keeps the score. And mm -hmm. it's so true. Um, autoimmune diseases are triggered yes, yes. by, <clears throat> excuse me, all of that as well. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It, it, you're right. We do not realize that that's where we're holding all of our emotions. Yeah. And I say they're yeah. stuck, uh, you know, so yeah, that, yeah. of course, it comes a domino effect. That's well, inf influences of emotional health, uh, how could then childhood trauma, early experiences yeah. Yeah. and societal expectations influence our emotional health and understanding yeah. of emotions as adults i know this is a big one i mean we all talk about limiting beliefs and living in the past yeah, yeah. so maybe you can let, give us some insight into that thank you let, let me respond to that then um, and break it down one is that talking about the whole aspects of trauma and then what actually went what happens when we have traumatic experiences so trauma what basically it means wound emotional wound so what it means that there is an overwhelming experience that the mind and the body of a child or a grown up who can be a soldier in war cannot respond to the experience. That we human beings as a living organization, we are continuously in a state of the, the stimuli and response. We respond to the environment. When trauma happens, it overwhelms us. We go, if we cannot do fight, say, don't do that. I, I hate you, stop that, or flight says, I'm, I'm out of here, run. We enter a state that is called freeze. Basically, we get stuck. We hold on. Freeze is a powerful emotional neurological response, which we, as a scientist, we learn only about last 20 years or so. When freeze happened, our whole body goes to lockdown, more or less. We almost our breathing becomes shallow. Our gut, that's the reason women get that in the car. Our stomach tightens as a way to continuously shoot um, um, the cortisol, adrenaline to our body to do something about it. So, and our heart rate is start to really wait for to, to, to respond to something. So we go to more or less a state of survival. Yeah. Our cognitive processes becomes really fight or flight. We become to develop a tunnel vision. There's another thing happen. When we go a state of trauma, basically what body is waiting is to close an emotional response loop. Say something, don't do that. Stop that. I hate that. Or don't leave me. I love you. Or... And basically, when that trauma happened, we stopped reacting because we feel unsafe. We, we feel we can be violated. We feel we can be hurt. So th there's action missing. There's another thing happened. When trauma happens, our emotional needs, those that I talk about, they get held back. We stop asking for what we need or honoring our emotional needs about what matters to us. We move toward the state of, I will do anything to get by, to not get hurt, to appease you, to please you. So we lose sight of what matters to us. That's the beginning of our going off track about fulfilling our emotional needs. So we go to adulthood and we don't quite realize that there are emotional needs we never got to experience to be loved, to be respected, to express our voice, to, to stand for our uh, life purposes. We just go trying to fit in, to get mm -hmm. by. So we trying to become a, a pleaser, you have a smile on your face, but we don't want to rock the boat because when we did it as a kid, we got hurt. 
So trauma distorts and compromises human growth mm. and can last a long time and a lifetime unless you realize it and you claim yourself. The journey of healing is a journey of, clean, of claiming your rights, emotional rights, that they belong to you. For what a reason, they were violated and never got a chance to experience, nurture them. Doesn't right. matter how old you are. Some of my clients these days, which I love them, they're grandmothers, seven years old. And they're saying that there are parts of me, they are still, as a little girl, didn't get fully developed. And now my mm -hmm. children want to put me in nursing home and I realize there's this amazing tigress inside me and I want to awaken. I don't want to die like this. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, I, I could see that. It's like putting a lid on your true yeah. self. That's right. It's, That's it's, right. It's putting it away in a box and throwing away the key. But it's That's right. It's That's fighting right. to get out. And that's, fighting to get out. Yes. Yes. And, There's and, a, when I and, tell people. Yeah. yeah. No. I'm saying that's that's the the body's response is it's feeling that fight to to want to be released, right. but you're not allowing it. You just push it down. That's depression. That's depression. Yeah. That's depression. Depression is a mourning. Depression is a longing. Mm. Depression is a sense of loss you feel. So there are ghosts inside you. There are yearnings say that I know the, the, the dreams, the hopes, what I feel inside me. There are flickers of that, but I see that. So depression is parts of you. You see glimpses of it. Depression, if you know how to look at it, is actually, it's your SOS signal of you mm -hmm. to you saying, wake up. You yes. cannot medicate it. If you take in medication, dear listener, continue with that. But depression is your own wake up so sign and sirens to yourself. Once you do that, your depression, in fact, I tell people, you will wake up one day. You are not depressed. You're pissed. You don't mm. want to waste time anymore. You don't want to play small anymore. And then you will, uh, Katy Perry, I love her voice. There will be a roar inside you. Let that yeah. out. Be the person you need to be. Yeah. Yeah, oh. absolutely. Wow. So powerful. Well, thank you for that insight. Because I can really, I, it, 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 when you paint that picture, it yeah. makes so much sense. And then going back to the body keeping score. So it all yeah. comes and folds together uh, into the mess that many of us become, you know, and not yeah. understanding yeah. why. So yeah. here's a big question that I'm sure many people have today because the world is yeah. changing ever so fast. How do technology and social media influence emotional health, particularly among younger people, young, yeah. the younger generation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. wonderful. So children these days, um, I mean, actually all people, we grow up with a good understanding of what emotions are. And because part of that, we haven't been role modeled that what does it mean to be sense of belonging, to sense of honoring your body, knowing how your body feels, if how is your back feels, you know, like how expressing your emotions. So social media becomes a substitute for expressing ourselves, expressing and creating interaction with others. There's a dynamic we need to understand between the mind and body. What I mean body is our nervous system or everything from under our brain to our entire the respiratory, cardiovascular, and muscles and, and bone structure, that our brain looks for pattern, looks for information, and looks for data to organize in the world. Brain only thinks in terms of black and white information. Brain doesn't feel anything. There are no feelings in the brain. Emotions are in the body. Emotions are in the body. So brain and body, this is the interaction between them. Number one. Number two, brain has a sense about the 
the past, the present, uh, and the future because it can analyze context. Body doesn't. Body only lives in the moment. So part of the brain and body and why social media becomes a, almost both, both an asset and a curse is because we see something in social media and um, is an in, inside video we liked and we give it the reaction to that and we feel certain emotion. We get, it's funny, it's lovely, we interacting with others. That emotions create a sense of dopamine that we get mm -hmm. excited about it. And we follow that as a way to bring more to, to, to our being. What we don't realize is our body is looking for comfort, just like candy. Our mm -hmm. emotion looks for comfort. And we mistaken being in connection with a chat room, with the, with the feed, with being in sense of belonging. One of the essential human needs, which I talk about it, is sense of I belong. Our be and opposite of belong is I'm isolated. So mm -hmm. we think social media, what it does, it creates a sense of I'm less isolated. But it doesn't mean sense of belonging. Because belonging means that I feel a sense of love and I give a sense of love. That I feel you see me and I see you and I'm part of the tribe. The reason teenagers go for something like this almost always is a vacuum of connections and emotional needs fulfilled at home. Let me give you an example. Two months ago, a mother called me from social media, lives in my community and had read about my book and said, Arashir, can I just take you out for coffee? I want to talk to, to you about my daughter. Um, a teenage daughter, seven, 17 years old, um, great student. And she said she's anorexic, runs all the time, very fussy with food. She's already seen a nutritionist for her diet seen a psychiatrist for medication because she's also diagnosed with obsessive compulsive and a psychologist for treatment for her emotions. So I'm listening to the mother, we're sitting across the coffee table and I'm watching her. And I noticed as she's talking about her daughter, her hands were going something like that. My daughter wants her to feel better, her her, um, her emotions, and I noticed she's, there's a peculiar hand gesture. I ask permission, say, can I ask you a question? What's behind your hand? She got startled, said, what do you mean by my hand gesture? I said that it almost looks like um, you're sculpting something, you're shaping something, you're organizing. She leaned back, took a deep breath and said that, because all throughout, she was talking about the sense of control. We want to bring some more control, some predictability. And I said that, is it possible you trying to bring a sense of control, oversight, managing your daughter's emotional health? She said, tell me more. I said that there are often children, teenagers, they go on like basically anorexic, it's not anything wrong with them. It's almost like political prisoners that the only thing they have under the control is going to hunger strike. Mm. That's how they get a sense of dignity, sense of oh, control yeah. and sense of negotiation. And I ask her, is it possible your daughter is trying to gain some, some level of control? And I said, may I ask a question? And I shared with her about the emotional right. What is a quality of connection in your house? What is a quality of love shared and felt in your house? To what extent there is openness to be there, to be with each other? She took copious notes. Next morning, I had a long email, and she said that what she and her husband that night realized that their house was really designed around managing, making sure that her daughter gets to Ivy League school and they crush it. But it wasn't really a sense of emotional connection that feeds that. 
Mm. Subsequently, she, her health, they basically decided to downshift with all her therapies. That it's spend more time together, less anymore versus instructing and controlling. So going to your original question is about what teenagers need when they go to social media is really a reflection about what's missing at home. Mm. Emotional fulfillment. So they go there and adults do the same thing too in terms of substitute what is not there. And that's what addiction is. Addiction is a substitution for what is not there and you know something is missing. Right. Yes, absolutely. I could see that. Um, and and it is unfortunately an, quite an epidemic because yeah, I think is. that there's, mm -hmm. because of social media on the parents' side as well, you know, and they're busy yeah. and they, unfortunately, a lot of newer parents with the really young children, they have their electronics as their babysitters. So they'll That's put right. the That's screen right. in front of their child instead of spending Absolutely. time with them walking in the grass or, you know, yeah, just yeah. playing with them. Um, and That's then right. it begins, right? The, That's then, right. That's then, right. Then the gap begins because there's no connection, like you said, a sense of belonging. Because, right. yes, belonging is human nature. And if we don't, we, we, we're, we can't understand, as you have most eloquently described, that just having someone on the on the computer or your phone is not the same as the actual emotional connection that that's you right. feel that's right that's from belonging right. exactly yeah in fact um three weeks ago on linkedin i put a post um, that I, I was blown away by attention basically what i said that the term attention deficit disorder is not attention, is attachment deficit disorder. We know from research, from multiple longitudinal research, people who are so-called uh, ADHD, distractibility, what they have in common that their early childhood experiences, all the way to the early phase, it was a distracted parenting. A parent mm -hmm. who was busy, whether it's mother or biological or a guardian, they did the parenting, but it was a quality of connection, quality of regulating, quality of see you so that your eyes see my eyes and reciprocate your reaction, your body, and then my body next to you. You create a human connection so a child's sense of identity gets formed. Mm. So what happens when it's compromised and whether it's mother or a guardian, is distracted, is overwhelmed, that brain enters a phase just like a radar. Brain looks for stability. Who's seeing me? Who is paying attention to me? And you go to this district. It's not distracted. It's, they are not distracted. They are seeking. Mm -hmm. Seeking a restore, reassurance and connection. So this metastasizes as a trait. These kids tr cause trouble in school or distract their daydreaming because they are looking for stability connection. They become prime target for social media mm -hmm. because they get those bursts of like community as a way to suit the brain. Once attachment bonds, connection happen, people will go to social media. It's not a bad thing but they are not addicted to it. Their brain is not addicted to that. So some of my recent clients, people call me, these are adults, professionals, that they've been on ADHD medication um, since their teenage years. And when I describe it to them, it's not your brain. There's some element of human connection. And these are mothers, these are you know, dads that you're still seeking that sense of connection as a way to settle, to find yourself. That's the work. And as you do that, you calm down, your brain calms down and you can consider whether you want to take a medication, working with your physician. What is the human connection, those emotional needs? That's the core. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So well put. It's the, and it's the shared energy of humans. Yes. You know, that's right. when you that's right. when you're 
in engagement with another human. Um, but thank you so much. That is, is so insightful and um, something that I think the world needs to learn now, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. stress yes. and emotional, now you, you said that it's not emo called emotional health, but I have here, how does stress, both chronic and acute, impact us emotionally? I mean, I've got emotional health yeah. there, but now I know that there's no such yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, wonderful. So there's an element of a stress and there's an element of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So um, there's an element and um, that uh, even in social media, and these are some of them, my dear colleagues, we use terms in a very loosely way. Is stress, chronic stress, and at what point becomes anxiety? So. Basically, a stress means that um, I'm sitting here in my office, and if there's a, let's say, there's a bang on the door, my dark Lucy barks outside, that's the stress. What is Lucy doing? So your body right away, something happened, do I need to do anything? You respond to that. You, you hear the stone on your window or something like it's stimuli happening, you respond to that. Chronic stress is that something like, um, um, your example is pandemic. When pandemic happened, pandemic was a stress, something we've never seen. Stores closing, mask, you know, obsessive hand washing. So these are all a stress because your body goes to sense of something's going on. It becomes chronic when it happens again, happens again, happens again. Mm. That um, you go to the store, it's closed, the items you want, you can't find it. It creates a sense of something's wrong, something wrong. At certain point, stress turns to anxiety. This is where the corrosion happens. Anxiety means um, that what happens initially from the outside or event or news or experience, it becomes your brain, body thinking that becomes a pattern. Case in point, I have dear friends. These are, I, I used to work in a, a, a biopharma. To this day, Every weekend they do COVID tests. That, that's okay. Mm. Then you go to their homes. There's such a rigorous way of, artists, you go to the bathroom, wash your hand with the soap two, three times. You take your shoes off. Oh. There's the sense of. <laughs> so I, I don't Panic. go see them, but part of that, <laughs> that's exactly is their body is going to the state of bad things can happen because happen to others and they cannot let go. Same thing with the child abuse, you know, bad bosses. You see the boss coming, right? Or your body's locked down. Oh my gosh. Uh, I talked to some people and um, they said there are some countries, it seems there to take, it's part of the cultures. They'd come in Monday night and uh, Sunday night. People have a gut stomach problem or oh, gotta go to work. So these are all mm -hmm. called a stress. Stress and anxiety. At the core is a sense of control, predictability, stability. So when that happens, you feel it. Basically means your body is revved up. Your body expecting mm -hmm. bad things. And you feel you don't have control. Stress and anxiety is in the body, is not in the brain. This is important, Jane, to, to, to go there. So it means, you know, when we have bad thing happen, COVID or like um, get rear-ended, the very first thing happened, your body revs up, your stomach tightens up, adrenaline, cortisol, so you can respond to that. So when you go to a stress, your body's revved up. At this point, brain tunnel vision develops about what can I do? Who can I trust? What is the action? You go to social media, LinkedIn, it is full of 10 steps for you to calm down, five steps mm -hmm. to, uh, to read better. These are all wonderful output by somebody who's already triggered, who's already feeling anxious. When you are revved up, your body is revved up. An anxious brain cannot calm the body. Mm. This is where the term monkey brain comes in, a brain that continuously goes to analyzing, what can I do? What is it next to-do list? I need one more application. I need one more 10-step program. No, you don't need any of that. What you need to regulate your body. And in fact, in my book, I have an exercise is that 
body, brain needs the body to calm down. You need to settle your body to settle in your breathing, five senses. Wherever you're sitting, fill the, fill the table, have a glass of water, smell the roses, go walk with your pet. So if you feel your five senses, then the other thing is happening, you're feeling sense of isolation. When you're anxious, is anybody taking care of me? Is anybody watching me? Is anybody seeing me? A sense of connection, a wonderful hug that lasts six seconds. A hug needs to be six seconds for body to feel it. And a sense of what do I have as a control? So by settling your body, your breathing, your heart rate, connection, and doing something meaningful for you, brain calms down, stress and anxiety drops, mm. and you find the term, you find your feet. Mm. Yes, you become grounded. You can become grounded. And uh, yoga, yeah. meditation, mindfulness, those are wonderful practices. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for that that insight. Um, you know, that that is something that, like you said, it's very prevalent in today's society yeah. because yeah. there are yeah. so many triggers that are out there. Okay. And learning okay. those practices is what I call them because they are a practice. Yeah. And, that's right. you know, at, and it's great to learn them before you're in that fight or flight anxious yes. position, because then you have those tools to go to. Um, yeah, so absolutely. yes, absolutely. I, I, I could see that. And I definitely understand um, the whole process and why it is so valuable to, un to unlock all of these incredible tools that we do have, and they don't cost a penny. It's really just a Absolutely. matter of understanding that we have within right. us the power right. yeah. to exactly. regulate, if you want to use that word, our our being. And it's not really That's even right. regulating. Absolutely. It's just it's just connecting with our true essence. That's because right. Because our That's true right. essence is in, in a state of calm, isn't it? Right. It is. It is. We are designed for health. We yeah. are designed for health. Just like any yeah. organization uh, or organism, when you're out of balance, you're not watered, you're injured, we are designed to find a balance, regrow, heal ourselves. Yeah. We in the scientific, and this is global, it's not just Western world, we fell in love with illness, mm. with the glorified illness. And in fact, um, it blows my mind how many people re reach out to me and they just litany of symptoms and illnesses, diagnosis they share with me. And as they work with me, they always say that actually they point their finger like that. You don't use the depression, ADHD, OCD. And I tell them, no, because illness is an expression. Illness is a consequence, is not a cause. Mm -hmm. Go upstream, fix the system, get the system to balance and illness is almost like your car, you're going to down the road and there's some engine noise. It's not about removing the engine noise, it's about what is out of whack, go look at the whole entire system, then the noise will go away. So instead of trying to reduce the noise, instead of reducing the symptom and illness, we, and as a society, I mean, we come to accept we our emotional struggles they're life sentences. Yeah. That's got to change. That's, that's not I true. Know. I know. I'm with you. Yeah. And there goes the medication. So, yeah, it's a vicious that's circle right. because there's a lot of money involved in that. And we don't need to go that's down right. that that's road, right. as, as I'm sure that's you right. know. Right. Well, here's yeah. something that we could all use. The role of gratitude, how it plays yeah. in our emotional health. Yeah. I love that. Gratitude means being in a state of presence, here and now. And whatever you see with a sense that it's good, the people you are with right now, they are good. And seeing the beauty, the reality of how things are and appreciating that. Earlier today, I was on a call with a senior executive who 
was um, reached out to me. Uh, she's a client that there are two major roles coming up for her, option A, option B. Both of them has a pros and cons, and she was stressed to make the right decision. Very important topic for her and um, by its nature. As I'm looking at her, she's all wound up. She's feeling anxious. Uh, there's a pain, and um, you can see the sense of being overwhelmed. I invited her to do a breathing. I invited her, she, she, she does yoga, to sit on the floor, bring the, her laptop by her so I, we can see each other. And I invite her at this moment, you're under pressure because you're trying to make the right decision. What is it right now you're feeling for yourself that feels good, feels enough? At this moment, each breath, find your base, find your essence, and just accept, appreciate, and notice that. So as she did that, you could literally see her body opened up. And she appreciated just being in this state to have these two options. In this, in her house with her teenage boys in the next room, her cat by her, that this is good. Those are options. They are not crises. These are not drastic events. Mm -hmm. And whatever I decide will be good that being in the moment, I'm safe. I'm okay. Another remarkable thing happened as she realized about that, you know, said, you know what? Option A, option B. Actually, I want something different. I want to create an option C. There's neither of those. So gratitude allows you to see yourself. It doesn't mean you become daydreaming, accepting something crabby or something you don't like, but saying that there are beauty in every situation. There's grace in every situation. There's fullness in every situation. Enjoy that. Benefit mm. that. Call them on your body. And in that context, ask yourself, what matters to me? What do I want to do? What is the right answer? So gratitude is about presence, knowing your power, and sharing that with yourself and with others and creating a space for any unfoldings. Mm, that is so beautiful. I have not heard it described that way, where mm. it's about goodness and grace, yeah. but within yeah. you. Within you. You know, you already have yeah. It. And, and that just allowing yourself to have the space. Yes. When you said that she had an A and a B and she was in her mind, she was just, you know, yeah. so caught up. The static, yeah. as I call it, was firing yeah. back and forth and back and forth. So she had no space to even think like yeah. or, or yeah. unfold what it is. And she created a C because that's probably what was happening is she was in conflict with both. That's right. She probably that's right. And she couldn't hear that. She couldn't hear there's right. something else waiting for her. That's yeah. right. Yeah, so yeah. you helped create the space for her to see, well, I don't want those, but maybe I want a little bit of this and a little bit of that, yeah. and then something yeah. of my yeah. own. Wow, That's so right. beautiful, That's right. powerful, and Thank something you. we could all learn, um, again, with practice, right? With yeah. practice. That's right. That's beautiful. Right. Thank That's you. Right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Well, here's a subject yeah. that I am very passionate about, neuroscience. Yeah. Yeah. We have advances in neuroscience depending on our understanding of emotions and emotional health. Give us some insight into what is happening in the neuroscience field with this. Wonderful, this, uh, wonderful. Field. The, the field of neuroscience um, really took off, this is interesting, um, since 70s and 80s. And in fact, the most of the work innovations came from the field of uh, trauma centers, pain clinics, and in the US veteran or hospitals working with soldiers with PTSD. The reason is there were large population 
of people that traditional medicine, medication, psychotherapy were not effective. Mm. So doctors, some pioneering doctors like Peter Levine, Bezel van der Kolk, um, who wrote the, um, the Body Keeps the Scorebook, or uh, Gabor Mate has multiple books about trauma. They start to look at this, why there's a human struggles get stuck in our bodies. So in some way, they were just like me, they were trying to solve a problem. Why suffering, certain suffering doesn't go away. And they realized it wasn't that, you know, traditional counseling, therapy, or coaching is trying to bring a narrative of, if you understand things, you can heal it. Mm -hmm. They realized that actually has nothing to do with that. Emotions, so this is what neuroscience is, if I can net, net it. So from the time of Rene Descartes, 400 years ago, I think, therefore I exist, there was a sense of primacy of brain. Even we use the term mental health, as if our health, mm -hmm. emotions, is our mental. It was a prim primacy of brain and mind as the major organ of our emotions, logic, and, and health. But mm -hmm. neuroscience showed that actually that's not the case. There's a term is used in neuroscience more and more that we actually we have three brains. Is our cognitive brain, so the processing information. The other part of the brain we talk about is around our heart. What this means, mm -hmm. there are neural transceptors of we pick up environment from the world and the major one is around our gut. So when we interact with the world, and I will talk about what is in a second, what is the implication of that? The way we perceive the world in the past was, we think it goes from the brain to the body. What we know is actually from body to the brain. Brain mm -hmm. follows the body. Then the way to think about it, our, our brain is encased within our body. So anything that reaches our brain is already colored by our body, by our nervous system. So if you're an anxious person, if you're a traumatized person, if you have PTSD, the way you think, the way you connect, the way you love, the way you lead is already colored by your physical neurological reactions. There is, this is number one. Number two, Brain remembers events, past, context, body doesn't. Body only lives in the moment. Mm. So if body's triggered, there's something happening, trauma, flashbacks, body thinks whatever happened back then is happening right now. Mm -hmm. That's a reason that part of the healing trauma, some of those clients, they go through flashbacks. Number three, this is important. When flashback happens in traditional therapy, conversation is tell me what happened back then, whether it was your mom, your abuse, bad boss, but so on. That is actually not helpful. You re traumatize patients all over again. Mm -hmm. If it comes up, what it means, your body is waiting for response loop to close body, our nervous system is very literal. It's, it doesn't use word, needs to see action, do something, say something, run away, scream, express love, express hate, anger. So the way you heal trauma or heart emotions is you invite the client to use the energy of whatever is coming up, good and bad and ugly, to do something right here, right now, in a small doses, you create a reaction that didn't happen back there. The profound nature of this, Jane, this is important. We are designed literally to rewire our emotional system every single second. Wow. That's what about healing, that once you know the reason you're hurting, there are actions you didn't get a chance to finish, to do. Once you do that, your nervous system, your pain, your PTSD leaves your body and you create a new narrative based upon your reality right now. You find your balance again, you get grounded. 
and you can finish a loop and move toward your healing. So healing, the work that I do, and I document in my book, these days, once you use neurology, basically learn how to hack your own system, healing is a lot faster. It's a lot deeper. You don't need long-term therapy. And they last longer. And you're transparent. Once you learn how this system works, you can learn how to basically self-heal, self-correct in the right environment. Yes, absolutely. I could completely understand and agree with you on that. Because I've often said that when you take an individual backwards to ha yeah. what happened in the past, I've always felt, why are you, why are you doing that? Because you are re-traumatizing them. They, yeah, you are taking right. them back to a time when it viscerally will hit them once again, but you're not giving them yeah. the tools yeah. to let it be released. You're just, you're, yeah. you're yeah. you know, you, you want the story. So of course you can understand, yeah. but they're not releasing it when they're going back there. They're just That's reinforcing right. it right. almost. It's like a record player with a, a scratch in it. It just keeps going over and over and over That's again. Right. That's right. That's right. And you've That's got to right. move the needle, right? So, exactly. 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 Yeah. The, the, you just said it so well. I was talking to last year to a colleague in New York City who was trained like me in psychoanalysis, and uh, we were exchanging notes. Um, um, so treating depression for a clinician is, um, is a major accomplishment because traditionally we've been taught depression takes a long time. So I was talking with this individual, very successful. She said, Artish, you're, um, give me an example of how you treat that. So I talked about the ind an individual and I said it was 15 sessions. Once a week, 15 session individual got a great the, um, sense of found himself, went back to the world and moved on, learned about basically more or less how to self-guide himself. His um, case was also working with the, the, with a male client. It was a four-year program, four-year treatment, three times a year to get there. So I'm just thinking, both I was thinking, the, the, where's the truth? Was I, I know I felt awkward, you know, I thought maybe I'm messing things up. After that, I went down reflection, maybe I don't get, to get it right. Then I realized, no, that's how we were trained as therapists. Yes. That you come there and you talk about certain event versus once you bring the body nervous system is the whole person involvement healing instead of trying to understand the depression use the science of depression depression if in terms of contain it depression tell you something unpack it and you can use the energy to heal faster mm -hmm. yes absolutely we need a whole new training on all of this that's right <laughs> because that's, right. that's, that's right that's right that's the archaic way and that's of course i understand and make a lot of money that way it's like I know people who've yeah. been in therapy almost all their life. And it's like, really? Yeah. I thought it was to help yeah. you heal, not to just keep yeah. going yeah. back. But right. anyway, right. well, we've got you got a lot of work to do, artist here. <laughs> but so Thank here, you. here stepping into the future. The future yeah. of emotional health research. Uh, what how do you yeah. see that? And I know that you're involved as well with a group of individuals. So give us some insight into how you're working towards that and what you're creating for the future Great. of Thank emotional you. health research. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So what I believe and it gets confirmed almost literally every week. So my book came out in um, in May of this year and quickly became Amazon new release bestseller, which I had no idea. I was blown away. In fact, people start Saturday morning, text me and say, did you know that? I said, oh, thank you. I didn't know. I didn't expect that. So um, it's really is about closing a scientific gap that we do. It's about what does emotional health looks like? We have seven enduring human emotional needs that they've been with us throughout the mankind. You see them in the Old Testament, New Testament, Greek, and Roman philosophers all the way to now, but nobody's put them together. Those needs are, um, I belong, I'm boundless, I am complete, I matter, I make, I am, and I soar. 
I describe in my book what those are, what is the science behind it, and multiple examples of people like us going through life, including in my book, I have a, for each chapter, each one of these needs, I have a Spotify playlist that once you understand these needs, they are all, you see them in literature, in songs, all the way to Katy Perry, Taylor Swift, country songs. That is all around us. Nobody taught us that. My hope is that getting the psychology of healing to where people are in families, schools, workplaces, communities, places of worship, that this knowledge, it's really, it doesn't belong to me. I was just, certain circumstances was helped to discover compile it and bring it back to the world thank you that's the book you're not depressed you're unfinished and people do write me across the globe and says unfinished i get it i know what that book is all about that if you're feeling struggling depression and anxiety adhd means part of our being didn't quite get finished my book shows you how do you identify it what it means what does it matter? And it steps to go there. And I'm starting to give podcasts, creating communities, going to group meetings, so people to know this. My goal is a movement that people know this, use it, build on it, do further research and bring it to their lives. And and I share this with my wife that when I take my last breath on my tombstone the following will be he helped discover the cure for depression and ease the suffering of millions that's my life purpose that that has been eluding us for centuries we know now that depression and emotional illnesses can be healed the science it's actually it's coming getting the science to where people are and so that's my goal and then if the folks they like this message if there are you want me to come talk to your place of worship that actually do people call me come to our church and and nursing homes schools by all means this message doesn't belong to me the world needs to know that and you know and yeah let's bring let's do this together yeah that is beautiful and so powerful. Well, you may have answered this question, Artish here, but it, I have, if there was one critical message you could share yeah. with the world, what would it be? Thank you, wonderful. So I'm thinking about the struggle that I had for years and I went to psychotherapy and I came to accept that my emotional heaviness ailment it's part of me because my mom was like that my dad my grandparents so if you have emotional struggle i invite you to think about no that's not your nature that's not your destiny that's not your fate is basically a science that it just discovering the truth about health and healing and illness. So don't accept as your faith and that you need to go through life like this. Number one, number two. So people say, so where do I start? Follow the energy. Mm. What depression does, what anxiety does, they numb us. We go basically to a lockdown situation. So follow the energy, the inklings, the joys, they follow up, the sparkle within you, follow the energy. Energy binds you together, brings you together. And the third one, please consider my book, the, even if you, there are some LinkedIn posts that I have, I summarize the emotional rights. Just read them and let it wash over you. And when people do that, they almost always says, oh my gosh, I get that. That's missing. I want that. So that the journey of healing is the journey of restoration. There are parts mm -hmm. of you that hasn't been restored and that hasn't be, has been dormant, just like the way I love restoring old wood. 
take all the additional stuff that they don't belong, take the varnish, the paint, could bring the original surface of the, once you do that, get everything else out, go to your yes. basic and you will find healing, you find direction. So again, don't accept suffering as fate and follow the energy, whatever excites you, brings you hope, follow that. And then let the emotional rights guide you about a way to yourself to start your journey. Mm. I love that. Thank you. Those are so useful. And I, I love what you said about restoration. It's yeah. coming back to our true self because when we're born, right. we're not born with all of that, you know, and when That's we're right. children, yeah. we're, we're, we're full of joy. I mean, That's right. there might be terrible circumstances for certain children, which is very sad, but it's not their innate nature to be, um, you know, to be worried or frightened or they're, they're in our innate nature is one of joy. And, and right. one of, of, uh, like you said, to f feel good, um, yeah, and yeah. to be happy. Yeah. So it's really coming back. And it's funny so that well you said. say restore. It's, it's funny that you said restore because it's like, wow, we covered it all up. So now I, I, exactly. I think of it as, yeah, first we have to excavate to find it. And then once yeah. we find it, we have to polish it off and restore it. I mean, Get everything that doesn't belong to you, all the do's and don'ts, shoes, guilt, shame, yeah. all of that, all the language, strip them off. Get to your yeah. basic and Absolutely. what was always yours. Yeah. 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 We, Artish here and I had an earlier conversation. It was so rich because really it, we, we connected on, yes, it's, it's just finding the inner essence of who you are and the depression and anxiety is they're, they're the, they're like the the rust on top yeah. they're basically covering right. it up yeah so, absolutely absolutely well thank absolutely. you well said yeah i i uh, i have one last question for you artist here because mm -hmm. we are here on the mm -hmm. epic vision zone if your mm -hmm. life were an epic story what would the title be he helped ease the suffering of millions oh beautiful and that came right out of you. You knew it. Yeah, it was there. Because, because I felt you that. You felt it. I was, yeah. I was born to do this work. I yes. suffered a lot. People who read my book, I suffered a lot. The reason is that I needed to learn what, what suffering is. And through that darkness, help people not to go there and find joy. And um, right. I do this work in my private moments. I'm doing this for my mom. She's... Mm now I understand why she through my own work realized what was she didn't get a chance to experience i'm doing it for all right. the people all the moms and dads mm. well thank you so much artish here for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom here with us and i do have his wonderful book so i encourage everyone to grab a copy it is so insightful and it, a guide for life for living a full yeah, life and a free life thank you. Thank you. and uh and and i want to tell everyone that for getting information on you and any of your uh you know your podcast your other programs etc cetera, etc cetera, all of that you can find on our epic vision zone directory so be sure to go and ch check that information and don't forget to follow me on instagram at jane applegath and check out janeapplegath.com where you can access your keys to your dreams. It's a free download. I'm sending you much love and success. This is the Epic Vision Zone, transforming your dreams into epic success. <laughs>